Hi, yes, I'm Heather Temple. I uh, am an audio describer at the moment. I used to be a promo producer. I made promos for BBC, Disney, Discovery Channel. Uh, I was staff at the BBC for 10 years and then I went freelance. And so I used to be given a TV programme. I would cut the best 30 seconds out of it or the most uh, relevant 30 seconds, put some music underneath it, put a voiceover on it and it would go out. So that's what making a promo is. And so I did that for 17 years as a freelancer, actually 15 years, and then I started doing audio description two years ago. Uh, and I work for SDI Media, which is a company based in Hammersmith. And I write scripts in English, I don't voice them. And then my scripts are translated into mostly French, Swedish and Danish. And then the shows that I work on get broadcast on French, Danish and uh, Swedish networks with uh, audio description in those languages. So all I really do is write. What did you know about audio description before you started? Um, I knew quite a bit because um, they used to, when I worked for the BBC, they did audio description on the floor above me uh, in their accessibility unit. So they did subtitling and signing up there as well. And so I was always aware of it. And I always thought it would be an interesting job to get into when my time was starting to run out as a promo producer because um, promo and TV work tends to be a bit of a young person's game. And as I was getting older, I thought this would be something I could go into which would be attached to what I'd done, uh, but not kind of as intense as having to make promos. So yeah, I knew it was there and I knew people who worked in it already. So I always kept an eye on them and said, if there's any jobs coming up, let me know. What's the daily routine of an audio describer? Um, I get um, all my programmes that I'm working on are sent to me by an FTP. So I would download my shows in the morning. A fast download speed's making a big difference. Uh, then, because I work from home, it's pretty relaxed. I can do what I like, really. So I start... You... you you set up the templates for the show that you're working on and then just start watching and then as you go through the program uh, every time there's a silence you block that out so uh, you put markers in and markers out and then with a the little bit of space that you've got you describe what's happening at that point. You have described for film and also for television? Mostly for television. Um, the series that we get to work on are usually um, Viasat shows. So I've worked on a lot of NCIS, The Simpsons, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Uh, I did the whole of Sex and the City, which was really good. Uh, Midsummer Murders, which is um, um, like a 90 minute episodes of a kind of a whodunit thriller type shows. I've done a few films, not as many. I did Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom last year, which was really difficult, but very good. Um, it depends, you never know what you're going to get. Um, also reality shows, I've done um, Ice Road Truckers, uh, uh, Porn Stars, which is uh, a show where no one ever really stops talking, so it's really hard to get any audio description in. Um, dramas, I did a Halle Berry series called Extant, which is very good. Um, another sci-fi type show called Sleepy Hollow, and sci-fi stuff is quite difficult because you're describing stuff that no one's ever seen before because it's, you know, weird and different, so they're quite challenging. I did a series called Bones, a lot of, quite a, a lot of good, like Hawaii Five-0. Um, what else? Kind of meaty, quality American shows that run to about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of those. And it's quite nice if you get a flow, because if you get a whole series to do, you can follow the plot and quite enjoy it as you're watching it. Do you have enough time to do the job well, or are you always in a hurry? Um, no, we get quite generous deadlines, and the more you do, the quicker you get anyway. It used to take me hours, but you just get into a flow of doing it, and you get to know exactly how many words will fit in the gap. It used to, it's very common to over describe, so you give yourself a space of say, I don't know, 10 seconds, then you write an enormous amount, and then you read it to yourself in the space, realise it doesn't fit, take out half the words, change half the verbs for single syllable verbs rather than two syllables, and 
hone it down and hone it down until it eventually fits. And then when you've been doing it a while, that stage takes less time because you don't really need to, you just know what to say. It becomes much more natural to know what's going to work. What kind of feedback do you receive and from whom? From my bosses. Um, uh, every now and again my bosses will go through my stuff uh, just to see if it's up to scratch. And also the translators who um, pick up my work when I finished it to translate into their own language will also feedback and say, you know, if, if they're asked, you know, and say particularly vivid or imaginative, hopefully, or, you know, boring if they don't like it. So you do get fed back on stuff. And also, it's got to be absolutely accurate. Like, spelling has to be accurate, grammar has to be accurate. There's no spell check on our system. And so, if you make a mistake, it will get spotted because my boss has got eyes like a hawk. And he, if there's a full stop in the wrong place, out of 5,000 words, he'll see it. So. And uh, is it a well-paid job, would you say? No, I wouldn't say it's well paid because I think there are so many people in the in the chain. Like in my case, I have to write the scripts and then I have to get paid, and then someone else has to translate them into languages and has to get paid, and then someone else has to voice it in that language and has to get paid. So the amount of money put aside to do one program has to have their money split three ways. So to make it cost effective, I think that you know everybody gets a small amount of money because otherwise it would be too expensive for people to do. So it's not a well-paid job, it's a satisfying job. It's not a worst paid job, but um, it's not the kind of job that you could really, depending on your living circumstances, you couldn't really pay London rents and survive just on the money you're making on audio description, I don't think. Mm. So which skills would you identify as essential for the audio describer today? You've got to have a really good command of the language, I think. The, the more articulate you are, the more words you have at your disposal, the more interesting you can make the work. You've also got to have a pretty good idea of, of what's going on in the world, because, you know, people like to know what kind of gun someone is firing, what kind of car they're driving. Um, you know, what the fashions are to be able to describe what, if it's a period piece, you know, the right words to describe that kind of hat or coat. The more knowledgeable you sound about what you're talking about, I think the more your um, viewer will trust your opinion about stuff. Because, you know, otherwise they could just be just making it up. It's nice to have a voice that sounds like they know what they're talking about. Then good command of language, good mm. voice and also an interest in the audiovisual product that you're working with. Yeah, I mean, I really like television and I like watching it and I'm interested in the content. So if you're working on a show, it's, everybody does a lot of background. So if, if I'm working on a drama series, there are enough fans in the world to keep sites like Wikia going. So you can get a synopsis on every episode of every bit of a, a TV show so you can read all that first and so when someone walks in and you don't know who that character is it's really easy to work out that that's so-and-so's ex-wife because you've read about it beforehand so having a you know keeping yourself informed of what's going on makes it more interesting for you I, as well because you know if someone's looking at someone in a certain way it's good to know why um, I saw something recently on Mad Men where the, uh, the children had bought their father uh, a shaving brush and uh, for Christmas and they gathered, they'd put all their money together and bought it as a present and it was a big deal. It was the first time they'd, as children they'd bought something independently. And then there was a scene later on where he was using it and all the audio description said was, he shaves. I was like, that's not the point, that's not the point. He's shaving with it for a reason because they bought it for him. It's significant. So you should tell people that because visual people who can see know why he's using that because it was in the episode before. But you know, you're, you're doing your audience a disservice if you don't fill them in on those kind of details. And uh, what's your feeling when you see your audio descriptions on the screen? 
Well, I very rarely do because all my stuff, once I've handed it over, once I've given them my scripts, then all that gets taken off to Sweden and gets translated into Swedish. So even if I was in Sweden, I wouldn't be able to hear what I'd said because they've also translated it into a different language. So I don't get that pleasure, unfortunately. Finally, do you see yourself working in audio description in five years' time? Yeah, as long as it continues. Um, you know, especially, I imagine it will get easier because more people can work remotely. Uh, and if that starts to be more of a trend, then there's no reason why it can't carry on. Yeah, I'd love to carry on doing it. It's great. And it just, sometimes you watch something and think, if I couldn't see this, I wouldn't have the faintest idea of what's going on. And so it's, you know, it's necessary to make things understandable. I can't see that there being less audio description. I'll carry on doing it as long as, as people let me, really. Have the tempo. Thank you very much. Thank you.